Oh, all right. We are now recording. Okay. Here we go. Recording. All right. I'll get rid of the dog. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you. And thank you, Barb, for organizing and for inviting me to talk to your uh, to your group. And um, some of you may have heard some of this on the bro breakfast with your broker call yesterday. We are going to do the same topic. Um, although Barb planned it first, I'll, I'll give Barb credit. She claimed it first, but then um, you know there was so much talk about it that Dominic decided to do it yesterday as well. But we can go into a little more detail here, I think, and hopefully that will be helpful to you. So the topic that we're discussing is a contract, uh, a contract issue, and, and that's always what I'm here to do. Is always something about contracts. And um, it is something I think is very current. We're going to talk about the use of the phrases as is and the phrase for information only relating to inspections, that last one, and how those work or really don't work in the contract in the standard agreement of sale and you know how you should handle these when they come up in a transaction. So I'm going to start uh, with stories um, because you know we, so hopefully we always remember the stories a little bit better and it puts things in context. So not very long ago, a few months ago, I had a buyer out looking at houses and we approached, we went to see a house that you know had been owned by the same owners for probably about 50 years. It was dated. It had you know there were things wrong with it. You could see, and um, the listing said this property is selling as is, and I said to my buyers, you know, what that could mean. I, I told them it could mean anything from you can't do inspections and you're responsible for everything, including the UNO. Uh, or, you know, it could mean almost anything else, but we don't know. So I would call the listing agent and ask. And I called while we were there at the property. And I said, so I see your listing says the property is selling as is. And she said, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, it needs to sell as is. And I said, well, you know, I have first time buyers, so they want to know really what that means. I said, um, you know, what, what do your sellers mean by as is? And the agent said, oh, well, you know, they don't want to do anything. They don't want, they don't want to negotiate with a buyer. I said, okay. All right. So can the buyer do inspections? And she said, oh yeah, yeah, of course you can do inspections. I said, well then, and after they have inspections, what if they find something wrong? What can the buyer do? And the agent said, oh, well, if they discover something really wrong, we can negotiate. I said, well, do you mean we can negotiate, like only ask for a credit? She said, no, maybe the sellers would probably fix it. You know, they probably want to fix it. And I'm like, okay. As is, didn't mean anything really to this agent. It was just a phrase she put in the MLS. I asked, and, I, and then I asked about the UNO because we knew there were some issues with the sidewalks and curbs. And I said, does that mean the seller doesn't want to do any repairs that might be required by the township? Because I'm looking at the sidewalk and she says, oh no, no, I told them they're going to fix that. They absolutely know they have to do whatever the township requires. They're going to do that. The sellers were really going to do all the necessary repairs. Their sellers were really willing to negotiate anything and repairs or credits for anything that was discovered. So as is didn't mean what I was prepared for it to mean and what I was preparing my buyers for. I was preparing them for doing all the work and accepting all the, accepting the condition of the property. But the listing agent meant something completely different. And in this case really didn't mean anything, but you wouldn't know unless you asked. If we had assumed the other way, we could have gotten in trouble too. If we had assumed that as is meant, um, you know, that, you know, we could do inspections, but, you know, the seller said they wouldn't allow it or the seller refused to do any repairs when the buyer assumed that they would still have the chance to ask for them, you know, that also would have led to disappointment. So you can never assume what the other party means by the phrase as is. And it shows up in the MLS a lot and we don't know what it means. The only way you will know what it means 
is if you ask. And you have to ask really specific questions because the first time I asked this agent, what does as is mean? She says, well, you know, it means they don't want to do anything. But I kept asking questions about specific inspections, about specific ways we might negotiate, about the use and occupancy. And the answers I got to those questions were different. This, the answer was the sellers would negotiate and would do repairs. So you have to ask good questions, specific questions, to understand what the other party really means. And we have to do this whether we are buyer's agents or seller's agents, because no matter who we represent, they may understand it differently. And we imagine it differently. We use our experience and we think it might mean the same thing it meant on the last transaction, but that's not necessarily true. Every person, every client and every agent may understand the words as is completely differently. And the only purpose that these words serve, I mean, the first place we usually see them is in the MLS, or we hear them in, in, in conversation or in, you know, in a conversation with the other agent. And they say, oh, well, you know, we need to sell as is, or my clients are making an offer as is. And we use these to communicate something. But what? Most often in the MLS or in conversation, we're trying to convey some kind of intention or expectation from our clients, which the listing agent might be trying to say, this is what the seller expects, or a buyer agent might be saying, this is what the buyer intends, but we're not being specific about it. If we just say as is, we don't know what it really means. And your client might say as is, and you might repeat it, but what they meant is different than what you th think. And then it's different again when you tell the other agent and it's different again when the other agent tells their clients. So we really have to be very careful of that phrase because unless we ask a lot of more specific questions, we do not know what the person we're talking to means. And whatever happens in conversation, whatever shows up in the MLS isn't what really decides how the transaction will proceed. What really matters to the transaction are the terms of the contract. So that's where we have to make sure we get the terms right, no matter what we said in conversation, no matter what the words were in the MLS, it doesn't matter. What matters is what's in the contract, okay? Everything else is communication of some kind. You, it may or may not be useful. It may or may not get the right meaning across. We might do a better job if we ask more questions, but it still doesn't matter. Nothing means anything unless it shows up in clear binding terms in the MLS. So be very careful of that phrase as is. The other phrase we're starting to see, and it's connected in, in, in context, but it doesn't usually show up in the agreement of, or sorry, it doesn't usually show up in the MLS. It shows up more likely in an agreement of sale is the phrase for information only. And this is often used written into the contract to describe the buyer doing inspections, but for information only. Or the seller, sometimes the seller or listing agent asks and says the, they will only accept inspections for information only. This is connected and related to the as is concept. But let me ask you, and th this is the, these are the questions I ask every agent when this comes up. So, so you're gonna do inspections to get information. And then what are you going to do with that information? What choices do you have? You, you did inspections for information. How is that different from all the time that you do inspections? Okay. That's why you do inspections, to get information. The question is, what do you do with that information? Do you have choices after you have new information? In the agreement of sale, you do have choices. That's what we're gonna look at in paragraph 13, the inspection contingency. Okay. And 
using the phrase for information only, some people think that you do not have options for what you do with that information. You get the information and it's like it drops into a black hole and that's it. You shrug your shoulders and say, thanks, go on with your day. But is that really the case? If the contract says you have choices, you have choices. It's the terms of the contract that matter. And so again, buyers and sellers and agents may understand very different things by the phrase for information only. Some people think it limits the choices, means that they have no choices at all to negotiate or terminate. Some people think it gives them some limited choice to negotiate or terminate only on certain items or in certain ways. Uh, but, but all of this is just imagined interpretation of that phrase, what matters, what is real binding contract is the, the terms of the contract. And if you don't change those, paragraph 13 certainly gives the buyer choices. So, the, so these phrases we have to be very careful with, whether we represent buyers or sellers. We can never um, just, we can never assume that we know what our clients mean we can never assume that we know what the other agent means or the other side of a transaction. And I'm gonna say this again, we cannot assume even what our own clients mean. We think that our, we, that our clients automatically know what we know, they don't. Your own buyer, your own seller will understand these phrases very differently than you will. So you have to be specific, ask specific questions about what they really expect or intend. And then your job as the professional, as the licensed real estate agent is to make sure your client gets the terms in the agreement of sale and that they understand the binding terms of the agreement of sale. Doesn't matter what was in the MLS, doesn't matter what you said on the phone. What matters is that they understand the terms they are signing in the agreement of sale. Okay. That's preface. Let's look at the agreement of sale. And I'm going to start the way my dad did at paragraph 25. So one of the things that we are often, um, you know, misunderstanding is we, we think we need these phrases, these phrases that are so confusing that, um, that people understand in so many different ways. People think that we need them because they don't understand the agreement of sale to begin with. They haven't actually read it carefully. So let me show you. The, every single standard agreement of sale in Pennsylvania, everyone is selling the property as is. Every property with every standard agreement of sale is sold in its present condition. That is how every single piece of property in Pennsylvania is sold. That's the same, that phrase means the same thing as, as is, okay? Now we can argue, my dad goes into this whole scenario about when is the is, and is it the condition of the day you sign? Is it the condition at the end of the inspection period? Is it the condition at settlement? I'm not even gonna go into that. The point is every property is sold in the condition it is in. It's the only way it can be sold. Paragraph 25 of the agreement of sale, the representations paragraph has two subparagraphs, A and B. And 25B says that the property is being sold in its present condition. If you can see that at 25B on your screens. I can do the annotation, but it's hard to do that and teach at the same time. So in its present condition, in bold capital letters, the buyer agrees to purchase the property in its present condition. It then has a comma and says, subject to inspection contingencies elected in this agreement. How many of you have ever read paragraph 25? <laughs> Take your time and read it. Point it out to other agents. Make sure your clients understand it. 
because this paragraph is here, adding the words as is doesn't change anything. You're saying again, defying the property in its present condition. That's already here in paragraph 25. And then it says subject to inspection contingencies. So even though you all know and understand that you're buying the property in its present condition, if there are any inspection contingencies elected, then that inspection contingency paragraph gives the buyer the opportunity to terminate or negotiate. So that is the only condition connected to as is. You buy the property in its present condition, except you have these options if you elected inspections in the terms of the contract that may give you choices to negotiate and put some conditions or compensation or adjustment on that present condition. That's right here in paragraph 25. Paragraph 25 already has the, the, the terms. You don't need as is, and you don't need to say inspections are for information only. That, that is here. It's telling you here what happens. You know the present condition of the property, and you either have elected inspections or you have not elected inspections. That's it. Adding the phrases as is or for information only does nothing, neither one of them, changes the contract. It doesn't change paragraph 25, and it doesn't change the inspections you have elected in paragraph 12, and then paragraph 13 has the, is the inspection contingency with the timeline. And so adding these words, even though people might think they know what they mean, even if you've talked about them, and then you put them in a contract, you have not, by using those words, you have not changed the terms of the contract. You don't need them, you haven't added anything useful, and you haven't taken anything out. So, Christine, now, yes. What if Holly, you're being instructed by the other, the other, the listing agent? Um, you know, any inspections are for informational purposes only, and they want you to write that on there, and you know that it doesn't mean. Okay, anything. the answer to almost everything is communication. Right. Find out what the listing agent means and why. Mm -hmm. uh, call them and you ask them. What do they really mean? Right. Okay. Because they could mean anything. They might mean that they expect a contract where a buyer cannot terminate or negotiate after doing inspections. They might mean that. Right. Or mm. they might mean that they will accept a contract that still has paragraph 13 in full, you know, fully um, applying, giving the buyer the choices to terminate and negotiate. Just because the listing agent says it doesn't mean the listing agent is really effectively conveying what they mean. Right. And it also doesn't mean if that if that shows up in the presentation of offers or whatever, wherever those directions are, mm -hmm. that is not binding. What is binding are the terms of the agreement of sale. Okay, so imagine the scenario. The listing agent thinks they know what they mean. They think they know what their seller means and they think they're doing their seller a favor and they write in the MLS and their presentation of offers inspections for information only. And so then the buyer's agent representing their buyer writes an offer electing inspections in paragraph 12. So paragraph 13, which is the inspection contingency is in full effect with options one, two, and three, except terminate or present a corrective proposal. But they write at the end of the contract as instructed inspections for information only. Now, what do you think when that contract is signed? What is the seller expecting? And what is the buyer expecting? It could be two very different things. And the buyer has paragraph 13 and has every right to terminate or present a corrective proposal. So the buyer goes ahead, does inspections, ooh, new information. And the buyer uses one of the three options in paragraph 13. Let's say the buyer terminates or 
negotiates. And the listing agent and the seller are shocked and dismayed. We said for information only, how dare you do this? Oh no, we're gonna you know, not agree to anything. You're gonna be in default, blah, blah, blah. And you end up with a big dispute because even though you followed directions, nobody actually knew what they meant. And mm. the terms of the contract, the binding contract, which in this case gave the buyer the right to terminate or negotiate was not, was not. what everybody else expected. Mm -hmm. And even though that contract may be right and binding and may protect the buyer and maybe the buyer and the buyer's agent even knew that this dispute was possible, they knew it protected them and so they did it anyway, but you now have a dispute and that's not gonna help the buyer. So just because this is a mistake that buyer agents are making all over the marketplace, they're following listing agents directions without finding out why they're there and what they really mean. Do not take the directions in the MLS or the presentation of offers as gospel. Communicate. It, every, different, every house is different. Every buyer is different. Every seller is different. No standard presentation of offers form is going to apply the same way to every client. I don't even use them for that very reason. I, I strongly discourage the use of presentation of offers that, that include anything that should be discussed and decided by every individual client, which they almost all do. People do it for convenience. They do it because they think it's, you know, listing agents think that it's there's some more prestige or something to have a prepared, you know, presentation of offer uh, form in the MLS. But almost all the time, there is something on that form that should be decided and discussed by every individual client for every individual property. And a smart, a really skilled agent does not take that form for gospel. You must communicate and negotiate. All communication is negotiation. All negotiation is communication. Just because the seller says one thing or the listing agent says it doesn't mean you have to do it. Your job is to represent your client. And you may do an even better job. You may write a more competitive offer than they told you to write. You may beat the competition by not doing just what they told you to do. Or you may protect your buyer better by not doing what they told you to do. Uh, just because we're on the topic, one of the things that often appears in those presentation of offers is uh, directions to put a clause in the contract that says any dates that fall on weekends or holidays will automatically move to the next business day. That is like forbidden in our practice. Stop doing it. Don't do it. Doesn't matter who tells you. Doesn't matter why. It stinks. Never do it. Never accept it if you're a listing agent. Explain to your clients that it undermines time is of the essence and that you should never do that. It's a very, it makes the contract much more riskier and confusing for both buyers and sellers. So do not use that clause. I see a hand up, Michael. Go ahead. Um. Uh, both of them, and for obvious reasons, uh, Michael, it's, I didn't hear the beginning of what you were saying. I said we often, and for obvious reasons, we reference the the PAR form. Yes. But my understanding is there's situations where we might not have someone using PAR forms, and if that possibility, which I believe is, what kind of complications does that present? A lot of complications, and if you are only expert and trained and competent in the standard forms you should uh, be very wary and possibly stop what you're doing if you're being asked to use another form. Any other contract that we are not skilled in might require a legal uh, or attorney review. Um, we are not attorneys. So Actually, uh, when- That's mind. If, I'm, if we're dealing with someone who is a quote unquote unrepresented buyer and they're using their attorney and their attorney is using their own form, whatever it may be. Then your sellers may need an attorney or your sellers may refuse to accept an offer on that form and may insist on using the safer form. It's a better form. Most attorneys in Pennsylvania do use our standard form. You will, however, encounter um, builders contracts, which are uh, complicated and risky. And that's another example of where you should 
you know, um, slow down and not make any assumptions and possibly recommend your clients have legal advice. Um, the other one you might encounter are assignment contracts, which are extremely, extremely risky and we don't intend recommend you don't necessarily participate in or your clients don't. Um, and anything other than the standard contracts, you are not an attorney and your clients might need attorney advice. Right. So, and that was your advice. I, I heard you say, maybe your client needs an attorney, not, Hey, have a conversation with your broker. It was, get, they, well, they you're, you get can always broker. start, you can always start with your broker, but the short answer to any contract is if it is not what you are trained in, you're not, it's beyond your competence. You have to know where the limits of your competence are and you cannot give a legal opinion of other contracts. Thank you. Okay. All right, so let me go back to sharing. So um, paragraph 25 is almost always ignored, but is important. And so uh, we start there as we've just covered. Okay, so remember that every single standard agreement of sale is already selling the property in its present condition subject to inspection contingencies. Okay, so what are those inspection contingencies? Let's go look at those. Paragraph 13, paragraph 12 and 13 we have to look at. Right. Paragraph 12 is the paragraph with the list of inspections where the buyer elects or waives all of the inspections. But it also has some important terms in, uh, in the first paragraphs, uh, first sub paragraphs that lay out the rights and responsibilities of the buyer and the seller during the inspection period or even if inspections are not elected. And then it goes on to the list of inspections that can be elected or waived. And then paragraph 13, the inspection contingency paragraph, repeatedly paragraph 13 says, within the stated contingency period, it says that da, 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 any inspection elected in paragraph 12C, all of paragraph 13 only applies two inspections that are elected in 12C, okay? If there are no inspections elected in 12, then there are no inspections for 13 to apply to. So then paragraph 13 doesn't apply to anything. It doesn't exist. It's like the whole mortgage paragraph when you waive the mortgage. The whole paragraph doesn't exist. I mean, it's all non-applicable. Right. So 13 only applies if ele inspections are elected in 12. OK. So let's go back up to 12 a minute. Paragraph 12 applies no matter what, even if all the even if all the inspections that follow are waived. Paragraph 12A and B still apply, okay? And this paragraph tells, this is where you have the um, requirements that the seller provide reasonable access, that the utilities be on. This is where it says the buyer still has the right to two pre-settlement walkthroughs. Even if they waive all the inspections, they still have the right to two pre-settlement walkthrough inspections. This is where, and I'm reading, if you're following along, I'm reading a 12A2. The buyer, uh, sorry, the purpose of those pre-settlement inspections is clearly specified that, um, that they are for the limited purpose of determining that the condition of the property is as required by the agreement of sale and any addenda. Limited purpose of determining they're in that condition. Then the seller will have utilities on. It remind, this paragraph also says inspectors um, have to be authorized, ha have to, are authorized to provide a copy of inspection reports to the broker for buyer. And then that the seller has a right to get a copy of any inspection report on their property free of charge. Okay. So this, paragraph 12 is important. It has some of these foundational principles in it that we 
um, that we rely on for a buyer to be able to do inspections and for a seller to get copies. It's important for us to understand this paragraph applies even when inspections are waived because every once in a while, in very rare cases, even when a buyer waives all the inspections, an inspection may take place. It may be permitted to take place or it may even happen ahead of time before the contract is executed. And the seller still has a right to a copy of that report. Because that's here in paragraph 12. And this, in the beginning of paragraph 12, this still applies even when all inspections are waived. Also, because this paragraph says the buyer can still do two pre-settlement inspections, even if they waive all the other inspections, the buyer still gets reasonable access to the property for those two pre-settlement walkthroughs. Sometimes buyers, yeah. yes, can you hang on just a second, Holly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sometimes buyers try to use those pre-settlement walkthroughs as though they were full inspection permission and they're not. It says right here in paragraph 12, they are for the limited purpose of making sure the property is in the condition required by the agreement of sale. So they are not an opportunity to negotiate new things that you discovered because you visited the property. If they are the same condition that existed before when you saw the property the first time, then this is not an inspection contingency. You can just see that they are in the same condition. Also, the pre-settlement walkthroughs are not permission for the buyer to bring through a home inspector or other contractors. They are expected to be only the parties and their um, and their licensees. Okay, and that's here. If you're going to bring anybody else to the primary inspection or to the walkthroughs, you need permission. So if you're going to bring dad or your buddy who's a contractor, you need to tell the listing agent and get permission. Okay, Holly, go ahead. So um, what do you do in the event where you're, if you are representing a buyer and the seller is basically trying to not let you have one of your pre-settlement walkthroughs? Point to this paragraph of the agreement of sale. Mm -hmm. Well, the, like in my specific case, um, I was going to use one of the pre-settlement walkthroughs to go through and because um, they're not doing interior UNO inspections, I was going to take the checklist once the seller completes it, go through with my client to make sure, you know, that she feels comfortable because she's basically going to have to uh, sign off that she's taking responsibility. And they're saying, well, I don't understand why you need to do that. We're having um, licensed contractors, you know, sign off on that checklist. Okay. Well, and I said, well, you know, she still wants to go through and see and they're, well, I don't understand why. And I said, well, we're entitled to that, you know. That You're entitled to a pre-settlement walkthrough. You're not entitled to do an unofficial U and O. Uh, you have to, <laughs> it, it's not an inspection, right? So if you happen to have that list with you on your pre-settlement walkthrough, nobody's going to know or care. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you are trying to do that, within some time period that you get to negotiate, or if you are trying, see, you only get a, a pre-settlement walkthrough to show that the property is in the condition you bought it in, in that present condition that it was when you signed the agreement of sale. That's it. Right? Okay. So, so I did reword it and I said, she did, she wants to do the pre-settlement walkthrough three days ahead to verify that all the repairs have been done. Is that okay? That's, that, is, that, is, that is a specific purpose of the pre-settlement walkthrough. It's establishing the property is in the condition required by the agreement of sale or any addenda. So if you have a change in terms addenda that has a list of repairs that the seller was to complete, your pre-settlement walkthrough is when you get to verify that those are done. Yes. Okay. 
that's specifically what it's for one of the specific okay. purposes and i haven't heard back from her but i'm just saying like she's she's really resisting this well if you present it as an opportunity for the buyer to some to inspect some new thing or check for some new condition then you are not asking for a pre-settlement walkthrough and you're trying to do something you're not necessarily entitled to do so don't misrepresent it if you come to a pre-settlement walkthrough right the pre-settlement walkthrough doesn't say it's for the purposes of measuring to see if your furniture will fit but if you bring a tape measure with you and measure and see if your furniture will fit nobody cares Mm -hmm. But if you ask for a special visit to the property two days after the inspection contingency has just ended and say, I want to come over and make sure that my, you know, heirloom grand piano will fit or I might not buy the house, you're going to be, you're going to get a no. Right? Right. Because whether your heirloom piano fits is not a condition of the agreement of sale and the seller doesn't want to give you another opportunity to terminate or negotiate. Okay. So stay within the context, stay within the terms of the agreement of sale. I'll give you an example. I had a client once, we sold a house, a, a very unusual sale, cash, no inspections, settling in three weeks. And the seller was actually moving out in just less than three weeks and moving abroad. They were gonna be out of the country, gone. And so it was very important to them. The reasons this offer was accepted was because it was going to settle that fast and the seller was going to be gone out of the country. There was no possible way that they could allow it to go wrong, no possible way they could allow for any further negotiation. The whole premise of the deal was it was truly, we made sure it really was absolutely as is. There were no contingencies allowing the buyer to terminate or negotiate. But the contract still allowed for two pre-settlement inspections. So we signed the contract and the deposit, a very large deposit, was due within two days. On day one, before that, con before that deposit was delivered, the buyer said, I want to come over with a contractor. We said, no, you have no inspection. There is no reason for you to come over with a contractor. And we don't even have your deposit yet. And the buyer said, well, it's a pre-settlement walkthrough. You can't say no. We said, it's three weeks until settlement and we don't have your deposit yet. We still said no. We said, after we have your deposit, fine. Because bringing a contractor when you had no inspections and no chance to terminate sounds a lot like an inspection. And if you're doing it before you've delivered your deposit, you could walk away and never deliver your deposit and there would be no penalty to the buyer on that on that sale that had no inspections and no mortgage and was going to settle in three weeks. If on day one, the contractor showed up and said, you know, this is falling down, the buyer could terminate. And since we didn't have a deposit, they could walk away. You don't want to let a buyer have a chance to do that. Stick to the terms of your contract. A pre-settlement walkthrough is pre-settlement. Reasonable access for a pre-settlement walkthrough doesn't mean day one after execution and before we've submitted your deposit. Reasonable access for a pre-settlement walkthrough doesn't necessarily mean, you know, three weeks ahead of settlement or doesn't mean so I can make sure that the UNO requirements are met or will be easy. So ask for something that was within the contract and you may be allowed to do it because you do get two pre-settlement walkthroughs, but don't ask for something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are important concepts. I'll try not to drag it out too much longer on this particular topic, but it's important to understand the pre-settlement walkthroughs because if you're really looking, if you represent a seller and you're really looking for what you think is as is, that, that if, you, if as is means to you no opportunity for the buyer to terminate and no opportunity for the buyer to investigate the condition of the property and discover more defects, you have to look for every opportunity where the buyer could visit the property and look for more defects. And the pre-settlement walkthrough still exists and they're not supposed to use it to discover new de defects that were already there. They're supposed to know that the property's in the condition it was in when they bought it, that's all. But if the condition has changed or you're afraid they're going to discover something new, you have to be aware that this is still going to happen. This pre-settlement walkthrough 
will be permitted. And you have to think if you're really trying to achieve a contract where the buyer cannot terminate, if you want to hold the buyer to the terms of the contract, you have to know what they are and you have to know what the penalty is. What are you holding? What security, i.e. what deposit that will prevent the buyer from violating the terms of the contract? And that deposit had better be enough, substantial enough that the buyer will not violate the contract and walk away and risk their deposit. It's the amount of the deposit that, that gives you the confidence that the buyer will follow the terms of the contract. And the tougher the terms of the contract are on the buyer, you know, the stricter they are, the more risk the buyer has to accept, the more important that deposit is for security. Because a buyer who runs any risk will consider, okay, how big is the risk and how big is my deposit? Maybe I'll let go of that deposit now that I've discovered something I don't like about the property. All right, um, let me move on then to paragraph 13. So paragraph 13 is the inspection contingency paragraph. It applies to any inspections that were elected in 12. And we're not going to teach the whole paragraph. This, this particular class is not about the timeline of the paragraph. That's what we usually talk about, 10 days, 5 days, 2 days, and all that. That's not the point today. The point today is in reference to condition, to as is or for information only. That's the concept. So we're looking at paragraph 13B. 13B has three options. Within the contingency period, the buyer will do one, two, or three. Accept the property, terminate the contract, or write a corrective proposal. In any of those three choices, the buyer will deliver copies of all the inspection reports to the seller, no matter what. But the buyer will have choices. Accept the property, terminate the contract, or write a corrective proposal. As long as there is any inspection elected, any inspection elected in 12, these options apply. Now, of course, you can think about it, you know, in theory, you can make other changes to the agreement of sale by, you know, striking out or overriding parts of this paragraph that is theoretically possible, not recommended, but possible. And if you did that, you'd be changing the inspection contingency. But the most common scenarios are these written in clauses or written words of as is or for information only. And by just doing that, you have not changed paragraph 13 in any way. So all the options of paragraph 13 still apply and the buyer still has these three options. Accept the property, terminate the contract, or write a corrective proposal, okay? So as long as you have these options, as long as you have elected any inspection and these three options apply, you cannot call it or you cannot expect it to be an as is contract. You cannot expect the phrase for information only to limit the buyer's options if in fact this whole paragraph still applies, the buyer has those options. So again, people sometimes add a phrase or use a phrase in conversation or in the MLS and think that it's gonna change something in the transaction. But if they don't actually change anything in the contract, these terms are still binding and the buyer has options. You do inspections for information, and then what are you going to do once you have the information? As long as paragraph 13 is intact and applies, the buyer has the choice to terminate or present a corrective proposal. Right? And 
I'll back up even further just to simplify this really, really simply. Any time in any contract that, that there is someone who has the choice to terminate, if you have the choice to terminate, you automatically de facto have an opportunity to negotiate. Because before you terminate, you can say, hey, see this part of the contract that gives me a chance to terminate. I'm gonna to terminate tomorrow unless you agree to these other terms. Anytime you have an option to terminate, de facto, you have an option to negotiate. But it's also specified really clearly and laid out with a whole timeline in this, in this paragraph about inspections that makes it much easier for us to navigate. So there are some other parts of the contract where there's an option to terminate or some other situations that might give you an option to terminate that don't have a whole timeline attached. Anytime you can terminate, you have an opportunity to negotiate. Okay. So, Hopefully, you can see that as long as, you know, between paragraph 25 and paragraph 12 and 13, that the contract itself has terms that either override or make redundant any possible meaning of the terms as is or for information only. And once you've accepted that, that the contract overrides those phrases, Okay, then using those phrases is only going to create misunderstanding and confusion. Because you're saying something, no matter what you mean, and no matter who told you to say it, you're using a phrase that doesn't change the contract. So you didn't even need it in the first place. But you're leading somebody to believe that something has been changed, that something is different, whether you're misleading the buyer or the seller or the agent or both. By putting that phrase in, you're making somebody think that something is different. But probably nothing is different. And that means you're heading for somebody is going to be disappointed. And you may have a dispute because you have different people understanding very different things. The contract will win at the end of the day. But even if you are on the side that is protected by the contract, even if you're the person who gets to say, I knew that I was right, see it's written in the contract, that doesn't mean you've done a good job and saved the day. If you have a dispute, if you have a, 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 a disappointed client, if you have somebody who has to spend more money or make more repairs than they thought they were, or somebody who loses out on a transaction because they didn't understand what was written in black and white, then you may not have done your job well because you may have known the contract and enforced the contract, but if your clients don't completely understand it, then they will be disappointed and you may have a dispute. And even if your clients understand it, but the other party doesn't, then your clients may get to say, I was right, but they might still lose the deal. So you haven't done them any favors. Complete understanding and really good thorough communication is what you have to rely on. Do not make any assumptions about what a phrase in the MLS means. Do not add any phrases to the agreement of sale without knowing what they mean and if they actually change something. And ask specific questions to understand what the other parties in the transaction really mean and then make sure that the terms you negotiate get written clearly in the agreement of sale. Okay. Now, um, what I thought we could go on to do, if, um, if, you have, if you can give me the time, Barb, and if there are questions, is I can expand on many ways where we can make contracts more as is, if we like that concept, if we want to pursue what you know, how we might actually achieve that concept or, or how you might actually get terms that are something like for information only. I can go on and expand on different ways you might do that. Sounds great. Go okay. For it. All right. So someone give me an idea. Let's make a, give me a situation, maybe drawn from real life or from your own imagination of what one of your clients means or wants 
in a transaction. Let's like make up a seller that says, I want to sell as is and tell me what they mean. And maybe I'll tell you how to get it in a contract or a buyer, what they so mean. Christina, and I'll the, tell seller, you. the seller needs every penny they're going to get out of this house to buy the next house. So they're not interested in, in paying for any um, repairs from a, an inspection or even a UNO. So that's from my imagination, but, but I could see that happening. Okay. Well, let me back you up to what you said first. The seller needs every penny. Let's assume that every seller needs every penny. Everybody wants as much money as they can get. That by itself. Sorry? Want and need are two different things. Okay. But it's the same point. Every seller wants as much money as they can get out of their house. So we should all know that the most you know, walking away with the most proceeds, if you focus on the bottom line, it doesn't matter how you get there, whether that means that, do, that you do repairs or you give credits or whether you negotiate or not, what matters is that you get to walk away with the bottom line at the end of the day, right? So that by itself is not a new or different condition. But let me extrapolate on what you said. I think the intention of what you said by saying that the seller doesn't want to spend money on repairs for inspections or UNO. What I'm going to interpret that to mean is that regardless of the fact that every seller wants to walk away with as much money as possible, this seller in this situation doesn't have the cash sitting in a bank account to spend before settlement. So paying for repairs, whether it's because of the inspection or because of a UNO or anything else before settlement would be difficult or impossible for a seller who doesn't have the cash, right? right? I think we face a lot of sellers like that. Now, let me say this, that situation that I'm describing now, this is most sellers who say I need to sell as is, or most agents who interpret for their sellers the need to sell as is we use, what, you know, again, watch out for that phrase. I know I keep repeating it, but it's not a good phrase because we don't know what it means. But most of the time, the idea comes from a situation like the one Michael is describing, where the seller doesn't have the cash before settlement to do things, to spend money and do work. This is the most common situation. And we should understand those real the mechanics of it, really, because then we can, instead of using the phrase as is, we can achieve terms. We can negotiate through a transaction that achieves what the seller really needs, which is to get to settlement with as much proceeds as possible without spending money before settlement. So throw out as is, and in this case, it means without spending money before settlement, right? Now, if you realize that, you can negotiate in a lot more ways and a lot more effectively than by using a phrase like as is that misleads everybody. Because there are lots of ways to get a seller to settlement without spending money before settlement. You can have inspections and negotiate the results of inspections as long as you the terms that you get at the end of that negotiation are credits, because those happen at settlement, seller assist, right? Or even if the seller pays contractors invoices at settlement, because they're still not spending money before settlement. You can also negotiate to change the price after inspections. And that again is not taking, you know, not making the seller spend money before settlement, right? So all these ways you could still have negotiations. You could still have the standard inspection contingency and, um, and achieve that end goal for your seller of not spending money before settlement. Okay. Now, in terms of the use and occupancy, the contract, the standard contract, we could go to paragraph, uh, let's go there, 15. Okay. Paragraph 15 is the um, Notice of Assessments of Municipal Requirements. 15B is the paragraph that says the seller will, um, at the seller's expense, order the appropriate municipal um, 
in certificate or inspections and comply with whatever the municipality requires. So it is the seller's responsibility in paragraph 15. So if you have this situation of Michael's example seller where the seller can't spend any money before settlement, how are you gonna get through that? You can communicate to the buyer in advance that the seller can't spend any money before settlement. Now, they can still order the UNO because quite often that is, or the, the ordering of the UNO is often paid for by the conveyancer or by the listing agent and paid for at settlement. So that cash doesn't have to be spent before settlement, the seller's money at settlement. But then what if repairs are required? So you want to communicate in advance to the buyer, buyer's agent, that any, any um, conditions that are going to require repairs, the seller cannot pay for before settlement right? That doesn't mean that you can't negotiate them. You may still be able to negotiate them in a way that they are done before settlement, but paid for at settlement. Sometimes concrete work is paid by an invoice at settlement, for instance. Or you may want to negotiate on behalf of your seller that the buyer agrees to accept a conditional or temporary use and occupancy certificate, and the buyer might accept that depending on what the conditions are and depending possibly on other compensation. They might accept a conditional UNO and a seller assist to pay for the concrete after settlement. But these are all ways you can negotiate without the seller spending any money before settlement. Right? And you can be prepared for them. And sometimes if you're, if you, need to insist on it, you can have these terms negotiated and established in writing in the contract from the time it's executed. But you can also negotiate them afterwards through the course of the transaction. You have one other thing you have to look out for if you have a seller who is absolutely certain they can't spend any money before settlement. Because there's one more part of the agreement of sale that could require the seller to do that. And that is paragraph eight, the mortgage paragraph, because 8G eight G is on your screen now. And 8G is the paragraph that says, if uh, you know the seller has to provide access to insurance uh, agents and appraisers, and that if, um, if the mortgage lender or insurance agent requires repairs to the property, the buyer will send that list of requirements to the seller and that it will be the seller's responsibility to make those repairs before settlement. So the mortgage paragraph includes the condition that um, if, the, if as part of the mortgage, the appraiser or insurance agent require repairs, it's the seller's responsibility to make them before settlement. Standard terms of the contract. So if you want to avoid those terms, you can try to avoid the types of financing that you think will require those. So you can try to avoid FHA or VA financing, for instance, but that's not by itself a guarantee. It doesn't change the terms of the contract. It just hopefully avoids that situation. You can try to negotiate in advance that the buyer would accept responsibility for any repairs that are required by the buyer's lender. But the catch here is that you can't, the buyer can't get the mortgage until the repairs are done. So these repairs, if they are required, have to be completed before settlement. It's not negotiable. It's not the buyer's or the seller's option to put them off because you can't have the mortgage unless the repairs are done. So even if the buyer accepts responsibility for those repairs, the seller has to allow the buyer to do them before settlement when the property still belongs to the seller. And it says here, um, we added it to this agreement, that um, 
it's in, let's see, 8G, uh, 8G2, uh, 8G2A. Let me show you because this is, is uh, getting complicated here. 8G2A. And it says, that the seller may require the buyer to sign a pre-settlement possession addendum in order for the buyer to have access to the property before settlement to do those repairs. So you still have to consider the complications even if the buyer accepts responsibility and agrees to pay for them and do them because they have to be done before settlement. Let me show you something. I'm talking occasionally here, right? I've talked in a few cases about negotiating in advance and having the buyer agree to terms before executing the contract, the terms that you're going to want to put in writing to say that the buyer accepts these conditions, accepts responsibility for some of these things. We have a tool, this form on your screen called the RRT form or repairs corrections required by a third party. This is not always, not always the tool you want to use, but I'm showing it to you as an example because it can help you negotiate through these things. This is a form that the buyer, it's an addendum to the agreement of sale that the buyer and seller can sign that specifically addresses repairs that may be required by the mortgage lender or insurer or by the municipal inspection. And in this addendum, the buyer and the seller can agree to an amount of money. And the buyer, if the buyer is agreeing to this, the buyer will accept repair costs up to that amount, whatever you fill in the blank. And they are accepting in advance that they will spend at least that much money. It's still, even if you use a form like this and agree to an amount of money in advance, and even if the buyer can't, uh, you know, even if the cost stays under that, and so the buyer can't negotiate, they've pre-agreed, let's say they've agreed to spend up to $2,000 for repairs and the, the um, lender requires scraping and painting for FHA or installing a railing, something like that. So it's under $2,000. You will still need the pre-settlement possession addendum to actually allow the buyer access to the property to do those repairs. And if the amount of the repairs is more than the amount of money you put in this addendum, then there is still a timeline where you might still end up in some negotiation with between the buyer and the seller. Because if you put a cap of $2,000 and for the UNO, for instance, and the township comes back and requires, you know, all the sidewalks to be done and it's going to cost $10,000. Well, then the buyer has not automatically accepted it. They accepted $2,000 worth of requirements, not 10,000. So you have a timeline similar to what you have in the original agreement of sale where the buyer and the seller can negotiate about that, uh, that amount of money and whether those repairs are accepted or not, or the buyer could again, have the chance to terminate just like they do in the standard agreement. Okay. So this document is a tool. I encourage you all to read it and understand it. Um, it can be useful to your buyers making competitive offers. It can be useful to your sellers who are trying to establish these terms in writing rather than trying to write your own clauses. You might use this form, but it's also useful just to have a, you know, a, 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 just to have a discussion. It's a useful tool to consider with your buyers and your sellers and in negotiations with other agents because it shows you that it's complicated. It shows you where these terms are that you have to think about and whether you use this form to establish the agreement and get over all the complications or you decide that in fact it's too complicated and you're going to avoid it. <laughs> avoid that, that doesn't mean that you can avoid the complications by writing in some simple clause. The point is the complications are here and you may have to find another way to negotiate the whole issue if you decide that you can't accept the complications of access to the property and what amount of repairs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But this form is a very useful tool, um, both for education 
and uh, and for putting these complicated terms in writing. Okay, and it specifically addresses the ROT form is about repairs required by a third party. So third party repairs required by a third party means municipalities and mortgage lenders. This is not a form that addresses inspection repairs because those are required by the buyer, not a third party. So this form is only for repairs that may be required by a lender or a municipality. Okay. All right. But hopefully you can see uh, by that discussion, and, and it was a very good example that Mike brought up because it is the most common reason we use the phrase as is, is when a seller can't spend money. And if you think of it that way, seller can't spend money, it's a lot different than using the phrase as is. You have a lot more flexibility in how you negotiate, in how you present a property for sale, and in how, how you establish the terms of a contract with the buyer. Much better ways to do it than using the phrase as is. Okay. I'll, and I'll say too that one of the, some of you may know, um, you know, a big part of my career um, through the last, you know, 10, 13 years has been uh, in short sales. And um, every single short sale begins with the premise that a seller does not have any money to spend. So every single short sale has to sell as is. But we stopped using that phrase. Just, you know, throw it out because it undermined every negotiation from the beginning. So every single short sale I've ever listed, I have to get to settlement without the seller spending a penny. And I got a lot of practice in this issue of as is because stopped using the phrase in marketing, stopped using it in conversation, stopped using it in transactions, but had to achieve the actual terms of getting to settlement without the seller spending any money. Excuse me, Christina. And the point is you can do that. Yes. Murray, um, just a, a, a side note here off topic. Um, I, I just made you host. I have to yes. jump off for another Zoom. Okay. So I'm going to leave, but you've got controls. Right. Okay. And I'll stop recording when, it, when we're done. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we are, it is past 12 and I can, you know, be as short or as long. I can stay on for more questions. Um, the next question I sort of expected, I'll sort of prompt you if you want, because I thought the question that's coming is, you know, buyers want to be competitive in this market. And that's why this is such a hot topic. Buyers are trying to make their offers more appealing by using these phrases, right? So I thought, you know, Michael's question was great from the seller's point of view, but what do you have from the buyer's point of view? How do you both make the buyer's offer appealing and also protect the buyer? Anybody want to give a buyer example? You have a buyer scenario where the buyer is thinking about these ideas? I just had one for my uh, cash buyer and they um, wanted to go in with um, inspections being for informational purposes only. And they um, obviously, and then the agent asked me, you know, about it because I didn't put it on the agreement of sale. So um, I basically said to her, you know, after inspection, obviously, if, you know, there's foundation issues or things like that, it'll be a conversation. So, um, but other than that, they were just willing to go ahead and fix whatever the issues were, as long as they weren't um, a big concern. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, did this buyer um, still have elected inspections in 12 and 13? Yes. Okay. And the listing agent understood that? Correct. Did your buyers get the house? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I heard know. some of that. Uh, yeah. It went up to 385. So the winning, the winning buyers were mostly based on price, you think? Yes. And that's exactly what she told me because there was no counter or anything. Well, that's good. And that's interesting to know because the other thing is sometimes the listing agent it will tell you when you when you lose out to competition, it's always nice to try and find out why you lost just so you know what you're up against. And the other answer could have been, well, you know, there was another offer with fewer contingencies. 
which you know usually means without elected inspections, right? Right. And uh, that would have made the conversation interesting because, of course, you did well, I think, in your situation using the you know using verbal uh, commu- using your communication with the other agent to express the buyer's intentions, but realizing that you were not changing the agreement of sale because you you weren't you understood that you know in spite of everything you said and even knowing all the buyer's intentions you still had elected inspections and you still had paragraph 13 which would have given the buyer options to terminate or negotiate and depending on the competition you were up against if there was another buyer who actually waived all the inspections you understand that could have been more attractive to the seller no matter what you say and no matter how well you communicate it the terms of the contract win at the end of the day and a seller could have preferred the buyer who actually put those terms in black and white and gave up the right to terminate or negotiate by waiving all the inspections right because that's yeah, even if, asked, yeah go ahead sorry i even asked her um you know, why there wasn't a counter or anything like yeah. that. And she said, where do you see how high that price went? <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. what it was about. The lady right. was retiring and she just wanted the most she could get. So, well, you know, that's interesting. And that, that happens, you know, when, when we represent buyers in competition, what we should always try to do is figure out what the seller wants. You know, what are the seller's priorities? How can you compete? You have to compete with what the seller wants. And some sellers will focus on the money. They, you know, they want money more than they want conditions, you know, or, or lack of co- contingencies. And, you know, depending on the house and their situation, they may not be so worried about having inspection contingencies. They might just want more money at the end of the day. Um, on other properties with other sellers, they may be willing to sell for less if they have less contingencies, you know, not facing inspections might be such an important thing for them that they would sell for less if they had an offer with no contingencies. So you get to know your seller. And so this makes sense for the seller you were dealing with, unfortunately. Sometimes it is, it's not always just about price, but for some people it's mostly about price. Um, but yours, but you, but you expressed it clearly. You knew you, your situation wasn't actually changing the terms of the contract. And you know, that's an example that if you're, when you represent the buyer and you're using these terms in communication, saying for information only, um, even if you write it in the contract, which you shouldn't, but even if you do, you're not changing the contract. So you're trying to convey some intention from your buyers, but it will only go so far. It doesn't carry very much weight. It doesn't give your buyers very much of an advantage because you're not changing the standard terms of the agreement of sale. And if you represent a seller and you're considering multiple offers and you have some buyers who are using all the right language to express their intentions, but they're not changing the terms of the agreement of sale, you have to realize that you know that contract doesn't necessarily carry as much weight or as much benefit for the sellers. And if you're a seller who really wants to have a contract with no option for the buyer to terminate, then the real way to do that is to have the buyer waive all the inspections, right? Because as long as there are any inspections, as long as there's paragraph 13, the buyer will have the option to terminate. And the only way to to avoid that is to have no inspections, right? I mean, there's no like, we, we imagine some gray area by using this language for information only or as is, and we haven't, we haven't created a gray area. We've created some confusion, but the terms of the contract are clear and binding. So there are some things you could theoretically consider, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take another like hour to tell you how to write clauses but I'm just going to give you ideas. And if you need to do them, consult your, you know, your broker or your pro coach, if you, if you think you need to try and use some of the ideas I'm about to mention, but you can theoretically write terms, changing the terms of the con- of the standard contract and establish clear written agreements that the buyer will accept 
a um, a certain amount of repairs. This is a common concept, you know, repair limit. Be careful with it because it's complicated and it's awkward to write. And many, many times people write it not quite right and put their clients at more risk instead of solving a problem. But it is a concept you can use and you can establish terms in writing where the buyer agrees to accept a certain amount of, of repair cost in advance. That's possible. You can also um, look at paragraph 13. Let me go back there, for example. In paragraph 13, as we've said so many times, the buyer has three options, accept the property, terminate the contract, or uh, make a corrective proposal. Well, interesting concepts, if you think they're appropriate. Uh, and if your buyer can understand, you can theoretically strike out or give up one or two of those options. So imagine if you put a line through option two, which is the option to terminate, you simply strike out all of option two. You're left with option two, accept the property or write a corrective proposal. Well, that is it. That might be a creative strategy, because um, your buyer still has the option to inspect, get these, get the information from inspections, and then has a choice to either accept the property the way it is or propose some correction to whatever the defects are. But they're promising by by eliminating their option to terminate, the contract is is binding them to a commitment to at least negotiate. They have no right to terminate based on inspections if you give up option two. The interesting thing about this theory is you have the, you write a corrective proposal, you have a five day negotiating period. And if you don't establish a written agreement with the seller within that five days, what happens? In the next two days, the buyer has the right to terminate. So the buyer still has the right to terminate if they don't get the corrections they want. And that still is pretty good protection for a buyer. Right? And yet it might be, you know, satisfying to a seller also who knows they're not going to terminate yet. <laughs> the thing is they should know they still have the right to terminate later, possibly but it means that the seller maintains some control because what sellers are worried about in inspections is the seller has no control at all for, for, for 10 or however many days the buyer gets to find out whatever they want. And the buyer has all the choices until the buyer makes a proposal or terminates the seller has no choice to do anything. So if you eliminate the choice to terminate, the seller maintains more control because they are promised at least an opportunity to negotiate. Conceivably, you can do the other way around and you can leave the option to terminate, leave in option two and strike out all of option three. Well, I don't like this option as much, but some people do because it says you simply have to accept the property or terminate. I always prefer negotiation. And even when, remember what I said at the beginning, de facto, if you have the option to terminate, you still have the option to negotiate. But it does create what we might think of as sort of a take it or leave it contract where the buyer just has to say, I take the property or I don't take the property. And if you combine that, if you eliminate option three and only have options one and two, accept or terminate, if you combine that with a very short inspection period, instead of 10 days, maybe it's two or three days or five days, you make it very, very short. Well, now you've created a contract with maybe with less risk to a seller because the buyer simply has a very short period to see the property and say they're buying it or not. You've eliminated or almost eliminated the opportunity to negotiate, but you have um, still given the buyer a chance to you know, revisit the property with an inspector and see what they need to see. So that this concept is a little bit like 
for information only, the way some people understand that is you get information and you say yes or no. I buy it or I don't buy it. So if that's the th if those are the terms you want to create, you can have a very short inspection period and eliminate option three, which is a corrective proposal, and simply have the options to accept or terminate. This is a concept you might use for you know, flippers or investors or a property that somebody didn't get into in advance. If it's a, a foreclosure or a coming soon property that the buyer didn't see before they made the offer. And so they literally just want a very short period of time to come in and see it and say, yes, we're going to buy it or no, we're not. You can make the terms of the contract say exactly that. Much better than using some phrase that is confusing, you can actually make the terms of the contract do what you want. Okay. Some people use this, I'm not suggesting that this is a good idea, but this is a creative thing being done in the marketplace. Just don't, I don't like what I'm about to say, but some people, you know, they market a property coming soon or they put it on the market, you know, before, right before a weekend. And you know, you don't have to report a change in status to the MLS, whether it's a contract or, um, you know, or whether, whether you're going under contract or, um, it, well, anyway, you don't have to report a change of status for one business day. But over a weekend, because it, our contracts include weekends as business days, but the MLS only accounts business days as days. So, the weekends don't count. So some people accept a contract on Friday with, you know, two or three days inspection period and a sort of take it or leave it scenario like I just described where the buyer has three days to say either buying the property or not. And by Monday, if they accepted the offer on Friday, by Monday, the buyer says I'm buying it or I'm not buying it. And on Monday, they change the status to pending or the contract is terminated and they never go to pending and they can stay on the market. Now for the weekend, they were under contract without disclosing it. That's not good, but I'm telling you, this is a sneaky strategy that is out there in the marketplace because with a very short contingency period, the seller tries to get the best of both worlds. They try to get a contract that they don't have to report to the MLS until it is past the inspection period. Sneaky, but it's happening. Same idea happens sometimes. Again, this is sketchy and I don't recommend it, but you might see it out there and, and, and think about it. They're doing this with coming soons also, because of course you can write an offer and a seller can accept an offer, even if it's in coming soon status, if the buyer has not actually visited the property. So let's say the property goes coming soon on Monday. On Tuesday, the buyer makes an offer without ever seeing the property because it's coming soon. And let's say it's not going to start showing until Friday, but the offers presented and accepted on Tuesday with a three day inspection period. So now it's under contract and the buyer hurries up and inspects it. And within three days says they're buying it or not. And either it will go pending before the end of the coming soon period, or it will, the buyer may terminate within those three days and the property will simply go to active on Friday and no one will know. Sneaky. It's bending the rules. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but that is happening out there in the marketplace. And it is, my point of telling you this is one, don't assume what you see in the MLS, you know, in terms of the history of a listing is don't assume that you know what it means. People might be technically within the rules, but also the lesson is you can make the contract say whatever you need it to say. You can actually make the terms of the contract do what you want without messing with phrases that, that just confuse people. All right. So I realized I was still sharing all that time and probably couldn't all see each other. Um, I can go on and on and on, but we are almost at 1230. So any other questions or we'll call it a day. Any of you, hopefully, all of you know how to reach me or Dominic and your coaches. 
And you can always reach any of us with specific questions, especially if you think about, if you think you need to write any terms into the agreement of sale for any reason, before you write anything, pause and pick up the phone. Um, don't go to Facebook with questions and ask the general populace, call your broker, call your coach, call me, um, make sure you get those uh, words correctly or maybe we'll tell you not to write them at all, but we'll help you avoid risk. And that's the most important thing. All right, I see no questions. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Christina. All right, well, you're Thank all very you. welcome. I will stop the recording. Thank you all, good to see you. Thank you. And Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Have a great day, everybody.